Hello, I'm Richard Quartz, Chief Executive of the British Council for Offices, the BCO, and welcome to episode five in our series of interviews we call The Office Briefing. Now, today's interview focuses on the coronavirus pandemic from what we might call the public health perspective. And I'm very pleased indeed to say that my guest to reflect what's happened and what might happen next is Professor Sean Griffiths. So welcome, Sean. Thank you. And thank you very much indeed for kindly joining me today, Sean. For those who may not know, let me tell you a little bit about her. Sean practiced as a service-based public health physician at a local, regional and national level in the UK before moving to an academic post in Hong Kong. Sean was president of the Faculty of Public Health at the Royal College of Physicians from 2001 to 2004. And in 2003, chaired the Hong Kong government's SARS inquiry, joining the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Sean is currently chair of the Public Health England Global Health Committee and a visiting professor at Imperial College London. And if that wasn't enough, is also an OBE to boot. So welcome again, Sean. Very good Thank to have you. you with us. Thank you very much indeed for kindly joining me. I'll get straight into questions, if I may. And my first theme is, is what we might call looking back. So taking a historical perspective on the pandemic, you chaired the 2003 inquiry into the SARS outbreak for the Hong Kong government, as I mentioned in my introduction. Now, were there lessons learned that we managed to apply more recently, Sean, or did we fail to listen and learn? That's an interesting question. I think that when we did the inquiry in 2003, what we were doing was we were uh, taking very, we were a group of international people who went to Hong Kong to look at SARS, a new disease, uh, something that uh, had threatened to become a pandemic, but actually ended up as a limited epidemic in certain countries across the world. So it was a, we, and we were uh, very much of the opinion that we shouldn't look back to blame. What we should do is look to learn lessons for the future. So that was the approach we took. And I, that's how I recommend people think about what, um, you know, what we've been going through in the last uh, 18 months. Because if you think about it, you, you have to put it in context. You have to put things in context. So we did learn lessons. We, uh, we thought that um, none of the countries involved were ready for the uh, the unknown disease, the disease of unknown origin. We didn't know what it was to start with. They only found out it was coronavirus halfway through. Uh, and, and the health system was not up to, was not up to par in terms of the quick, of its speed of response, nor was the public health system. Um, and, uh, and the government was slow to make decisions. So quite a lot of themes you'll hear coming out again. I mean, we, we said that uh, in the future, what you really needed is good communication. You needed clarity about who was doing what. You needed cooperation and collaboration. We, you know, there's very simple messages about you need a systems view and you need to respond very quickly. Uh, so, and, and you need a good flow of information and you need the academics not to be precious about publishing their papers, but to make sure research is, is what is widely available and quickly available because we found sort of Indonesia warfare is who's going to get their journal published first uh, they, they did their paper in the biggest journal first so so we we, we um and and then um uh, I think that actually uh, I mean I know Hong Kong best but I also know in Canada that the consequent of uh of, of the reviews that were done in both Canada and and in Hong Kong steps were then taken to to address some of the issues we'd raised. So that was, uh, and so for example, in um, Hong Kong, they opened the um, Center for Health Protection, which is, uh, which is the equivalent of um, a, a CDC, a Communicable Disease Center. And in Canada, they also set up another sort of national public health organization. So people recognize public health was important. Question of whether we applied it, the question is who's we? Um, because if you look at the differences between, um, say, Asia and Europe, uh, Asia, we often cite the countries in Asia, uh, 
Singapore, Taiwan, Korea, China, Hong Kong as being better prepared uh, because they had actually had experience with SARS in the past than when it came across to Europe. And we were much slower off the blocks actually to take um, quite draconian action. Uh, for example, in Hong Kong, they closed the borders before they had any cases not deaths cases. Well, that's, it's interesting you say that, Sean, because that's my, my next sort of theme, the East, East versus West, if you like. But before we get to that, I was very interested to use the word blame. And clearly there will be an inquiry here in, in due course. I and mean, rightly, in my view, the, the government doesn't feel it's, it's the right time yet, but it will come. But, but 2020 hindsight is a very easy, easy thing. And I think there is always a danger with inquiries that, that that people are revisionist historians. They, they blame a government retrospectively for doing something when they weren't actually calling for that at the time. They just, having seen what happened since, they decided that's what they would have done and therefore called for, but didn't at the time. So yeah. I think we have to be careful, but I'll come on to this East versus West theme, if I may, because you're still involved with public health in, in China. And I'd, I'd like to quiz you, Sean, if I may, on, on what, your perspective is of, of both the origins of the virus and the Chinese and indeed the East's more generally response to it? Uh, well, if you take the origins of the virus, the origins, as you know, there was a WHO um, visit, uh, what was about a couple of months ago now, I think. I can't, I mean, you know, within recent, within recent um, history, uh, uh, to look to see you know, could they find the cause? Could they find where the virus had come from? Uh, and quite a lot of the report looks very similar to the, the SARS report, where um, the, uh, the the thinking is that the uh, that the virus has jumped from animal to man. Uh, and in the case of SARS in two thousand and three, it was a, from a bat reservoir. Uh, through um, an animal called civet cat, which is a delicacy sold in the uh, in the wild markets, not the wet markets. People often say wet markets. I think anyone who knows Asia, that wet markets is just a phrase that's used for fresh food, fresh food markets. So there's been quite a lot of sort of conspiracy theory about um, uh, about the, the origins of the virus. But what we do know is that the bat population acts as a reservoir for, the, for coronavirus, it doesn't cause disease in the bats. It has, in the case of SARS, it transferred via civet cats to man. Uh, and, and that we expect to see much more of that if we don't get a grip on animal husbandry and the conditions in which our food is produced. So the, there's a whole story there. There's a sort of counter story for um, coronavirus this time around, which is uh, that it might have been imported on frozen food because it was found in the fish market in Wuhan. Um, uh, it was traced to having, could definitely be traced to, to the fish market in Wuhan and some of the fish that was there had come in um, and the virus is known to be okay at cold temperatures. And so it's, it's a sort of, you know, another story. Actually, how it emerged is not absolutely clear. What we do know is that once it got into um, the human chain, uh, that, that there was no immunity. And so as there was no immunity, uh, that's when disease occurs and spreads rapidly because what you need and what we understand now very well, because you know, we, know, we, know, we thought it would work, but vaccination raises your immunity. You need immunity to fight. A, a new disease because you won't have been exposed to it in the past and therefore large numbers of people are going to get it. So the uh, work that uh, has been done is inconclusive as to what was the actual source. But as we watch and we see variants emerge, you know, the story changes. We've seen the variants. So if you take now, uh, you look at the first variant, what we, you can loosely call it the Wuhan variant probably wasn't the same as was in Italy, which is where the Euro first European disease that came into the UK came from. Then our real problems started last November when the Kent variant emerged. And I'm using the colloquial phrasing because that's, you know, 
purists would use the um, the number, you know, B117, but I'm using the colloquial just to make it a bit easier. So by the time you get the Kent variant, what emerged in uh, in the south of England in um, 2000, this last year, 2020, was that um, the, uh, the, we thought the numbers were lower in the south and that was the north we were focusing on. Suddenly the numbers started to rise in the south and then people realized we've got a different disease. So, so it's very hard to say where's the origin of the actual of, of coronavirus. It could have come from somewhere else. It might not have been picked up. It might not have been diagnosed. But as it became apparent that there was an epidemic in Wuhan, um, then you could see that that and that it was caused by coronavirus. Uh, you could see that that's where that's where we knew the first cases were. So we know the first cases were in China. We saw how China then reacted. Um, you know, throw a cordon around Wuhan. And when that first happened, I think people in the West are going, yeah, you can't do that, you know. Uh, but in fact, now we realize that actually you can do that. You can put cordons around large populations in the West as well as in the East, because you could easily say for the East, oh, it's a different political situation, a different culture. Um, it is, but actually it's an effective thing to do to put in border controls, um, to stop people traveling, to stop, you know, to really focus on who's got the disease and to clamp down and to actually stop the chain of transmission. So uh, I think there are differences in East and West. Um, some of it is about culture and some of it is about having gone through something like SARS in the past and saying, actually, we know this is a threat. So it's about actually readiness to act uh, as much as anything else. And we may not see such a big difference next time around. Very interesting, Sean. And I've learned something on the on the wet markets and the wild markets. I wasn't aware of, of, of that distinction. And, and looking back at what happened, I mean, one of the, the criticisms that was made of, of Boris Johnson and, and the UK government was, was being too slow to react. But I think there was in, initially at the beginning of 2020, 2020 but I think there was a, a real anxiety and hesitation within the prime minister, perhaps particularly, about whether people would comply. And that difference between what a, a totalitarian regime can do, effectively lock people up in extremists, and what a, a, a liberal Western democracy feels it can actually impose on a free society. And, and yet there was a sort of paradox in that people were, and I noticed this in my journey to London, people were, were, were starting to, to retreat and, and work from home and, and isolate and, and not socialize before they were mandated to do so, which I think is, is quite interesting in itself. And I'm going to move on to Britain for the next theme, if, if I may, and, and, and how we've done effectively looking at what's gone on elsewhere. So how would you assess, Sean, the way in which the government, the UK government has responded to the coronavirus pandemic and what less lessons should we learn from that? Well, I think that's a huge question. And as I said earlier, I think it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, to actually uh, criticize. What you can do is make have a commentary and you can, you know, I'm an epidemiologist, so I come from a scientific background, population science. And if you look at the way that epidemiology has been used, and that's what I can talk about more than government, because uh, I think that if you look at the roles of Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty in the English situation, and you have to remember we're four countries in the UK, um, because I'm also on the board of Public Health Wales, and I'm very aware of a different narrative in Wales. You, you, you know, the kind of different countries have behaved differently, but but uh, so it's not easy to say what you you know you can say about England. Um, Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance have been very keen to keep the science neutral so that decisions are made on the back of the science. And so it's politicians have to make the judgments. And you were mentioning about um, an unwillingness to lock people away because we believed that people wouldn't comply. And there's a huge amount now of very interesting research about that, how that was a misassumption, but you wouldn't have known it. So it's very difficult to be critical. So it, it's, it's, you know, in retrospect, we'll say, well, people are actually much more willing to comply. And you can say it's not just the, um, it's not just the, 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 the single, single party regimes in China, it, it's also New Zealand and, and Australia who've chosen a, um, a, 
uh, a, a zero uh, a, a zero COVID policy. So, so there's a sort of sense in which it, the story, the narrative will change as time goes on. Um, uh, and in fact, um, the in fact the UK, not just the English population, have been very good at following the guidelines. Uh, the compliance has been pretty good. And also uptake, uptake of vaccine, for example, huge success when you compare to France. And you look at France and you, um, France is now getting its act together, but it took a while to get its act together in terms of getting the vaccine rollout going because of vaccine scepticism, vaccine hesitancy, lack of trust in politicians, uh, lack of trust in Western medicine, all sorts of issues, D different, different cuts on the same thing. So I think that um, I think that what we'll see is that we definitely didn't have the capacity to test and trace. I don't think that's going to be anything we could argue about. And we could say, have we under invest have we under invested in um, public health? And as a public health person, I'd say yes, and don't don't just regress because uh, if you if you think oh you put some in this year to keep it going, make sure that the local systems are well funded. I think we'll find we didn't rely on basic public health um, in the local areas enough to start with, and there was the big test and trace, uh, you know, investment and uh, and and all of those things. Um, and and obviously we didn't get care homes right. Um, I think that that will be another issue that I don't think there's much you know, why we didn't maybe of debate, but I think if you look at the statistics, you can just say from the statistics, the numbers of vulnerable people who died, um, we, you know, could we have done better? And I prefer the question, could we have done better? And what could we have done better? So what do we learn for the future? Because I don't think, I don't think pointing fingers of blame retrospectively are terrib is a terribly helpful thing to do. Um, you know, they did it in Hong Kong. They did it in the, the we, we produced a report where we said, actually, people did really well the, the the government did well the the, the senior health um health people did well and um uh, Legco, the government there didn't like our report so they did another one which did finger pointing so they could get rid of the people they wanted us to get rid of i mean it was like uh, you know and and it's so it's just one of those lessons you learn that's why i'm very cautious about um you know how you look back and why you're looking back and what you're trying to do when you look back so if you're just trying to get a few heads on spikes it's actually pretty meaningless for the future. And, you know, we don't know when the next new variants going, new disease is going to come from. I agree. I, I, I think that's a very fair analysis. And I think, you know, clearly objectively looking back with the benefit of hindsight in you know, retrospective wisdom, there are, there are mistakes that the government made and things that we, you know, they would have done differently, no doubt. But I defy any set of politicians to have done better in the same circumstances, which were clearly the worst that any UK government has faced since since September 1939 and, and the start of the Second World War. I mean, it was just extraordinary. You know, no government since that period has faced anything like this in its scale and, and magnitude and, and urgency and enormously difficult. And I think, you know, looking at, as you, you rightly say, Sean, you know, the the, the vaccine rollout, as to use the buzz phrase at the moment, has been, you know, astonishing. And the procurement process, nothing short of brilliant, I think. I mean, yes. absolutely yeah. stunning what was achieved by Kate Bingham and, and her team. So, you know, some real, some real credits there, I, I think. And I'm, I'm going to move on, though, if I may, to, to sort of a business theme for the next question. And, and looking at, at business and, and more broadly, how do you think others have responded, particularly the public and business? And are there broader lessons to learn from the response which should apply to public health more generally? Yes, well, if you take the public first, uh, I think we did find that the public responded very responsibly uh, and actually put up with huge hardships with relatively little complaining um, and that uh, I think the spirit of resilience that came through with the Thursday evening claps for example um, was a sort of you know let's pull together let's 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 see this thing off and uh, that that's been quite a lot of the tenor um, huge respect for our NHS. Our NHS is, is phenomenal. And um, I've always said when I've worked elsewhere, you know, you could say to a class full of people in Hong Kong, 
Um, we don't pay for healthcare in the UK when we go to get it. We have a free National Health Service tax funded, yes, but we can have care at the point of need when you need it. Nobody's going to be denied that. And, and, and that, that is such a fundamental part of, I think, of our society, the belief in the NHS and, um, and the fact that you do get treated when you need to be treated. And that is really different from other places. And we've seen that play out. We've seen governments have to jump in and fund things um, because you can't let the private market get in the way of something like a pandemic. So um, the public have, have rallied around, the NHS has rallied around, and it has had a huge spirit of, um, uh, of selflessness, really, I think, about, about the whole response. Uh, I think that if you'd said uh, we could uh, make everybody work from home or nobody should go to work uh, except working from home and we'd have furlough, if you'd said that before the pandemic, people would have said, oh, that's not possible. Um, it is possible. So all things are possible. So the question I think now that faces this is what, 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 is, what is the best way to regroup and um, how, what have we learned from the ways in which we're working now. And I think um, what we've learned is that you can be much more flexible. Um, uh, and I think to start with, everybody was very, uh, quite a lot of people were quite happy to be working from, particularly women with children, um, you know, because you actually, mind you, I've got two daughters who had to do homeschooling and I'm not quite, I think, I think they might have been pleased initially, but actually, uh, you know, juggling everything got a bit difficult. Um, so what we do, what, what we know is that, you know, it isn't quite as simple as it might sound. Uh, I think that we, in the future, as we come back to thinking about going back to work, we do need to think about working conditions because we do need to think about, <clears throat> we need to think about how we get to work. I think people will be nervous initially going back to work. I don't know how quickly it'll take people, you know, people will come feel comfortable on crowded trains and, uh, and, and on commuting. So that may, may be questions there. Uh, there may be questions when you get to work about the environment in which you're working. Um, you know, people may be more aware of ventilation and the issues around ventilation, for example, workspace, uh, hygiene in the workplace, all of those issues, hopefully. I think hygiene that we possibly let that slip quite a lot uh, and, uh, and flexibility. But I also think another element here is about resilience and mental health and how are we actually looking after the whole person? Uh, so there's some questions there that will need to be considered as workplaces reopen. You know, do you have to, can you have flexible working? How, how, do, you, how do you arrange it? Um, you know, whose terms? Uh, all of these issues. So I think we're facing a time of change in the workplace consequent on having had uh, COVID. And I think some of the changes will be good, some will be not so good. I do think um, the challenge of resilience and mental health is a big one that needs to be put way up there on the agenda. Are we able to support people back into the workplace? Uh, and are we able to support uh, ongoing flexible working as well? I think those are two things which will change and they have health impacts. Um, how you support your staff is obviously, uh, can, do you offer, you know, how do you offer them a sense of well-being in the workplace? Very important. Uh, and what about flexibility of working, thinking more about the family, thinking more about uh, just, you know, do you have to spend your time commuting every day? Can you do it less days? I'm thinking of my, um, my son who's just going back into the office two days a week instead of five. I'm thinking um, uh, and is capable of working from home. You know, the, the, that's, a, and I think he wants to maintain that pattern. He's got two small children. And um, he's a great help to his wife, who's also working, partnership. Uh, those things are important in the future. And maybe we've learned that. Maybe quality of life will improve because we've learned that. So it's a, it's, there's going to be lots to talk about, lots to think about, and lots of active thinking that's going to need to go on to create sort of more healthy workplaces with healthier people within them. Uh, and I suppose, finally, I would say that um, I, I did think that the difficulty that people faced if they tested positive and they were on, um, in, in, you know, uh, uh, they, they were freelance. That was a hugely difficult issue for people because, you know, you, you, if you have to be um, in isolation, you can't earn a salary uh, and you have responsibilities and you may well be low paid as it, uh, anyway. So things like that are all important to think about.
in terms of how society structures work, as well as how workplaces, you know, uh, how workplaces structure themselves. An awful lot there, Sean. I mean, unsurprisingly, you know, many of these themes have sort of come through in this series of interviews and, and its predecessor series over the last few months. I mean, health and wellness is, is a, has been a core mantra of the BCO for a long time, long before the coronavirus pandemic struck, of course, and the importance of, of fresh air and, and, and light and the right temperature and so on and so forth in, in the office to provide a, a, a comfortable environment where people actually want to be and, and work can work effectively is, is nothing less than crucial. It's been brought, of course, into absolutely sharp relief as a consequence of the pandemic. And I think I agree with you. I think that the consequences of this are going to be quite profound. I mean, there, there are widely varying opinions within business and within elements of business as to quite how this will pan out. I was taken by a piece uh, reported yesterday about the difference between the US banking community and the and the UK and European banking community, where it seems to be quite different with different with, with generally the US bank saying everyone's going back to the office nine to five, five days a week, that's how it is. And and across the Atlantic, a much more nuanced approach with a, a greater desire to to embrace flexibility and so on and so forth. But I think, you know, having gone through this extraordinary experiment, there will be very profound consequences, many of which haven't been thought about yet. And it's clearly going to take quite a time to pan out. But there's there is a there is a lot more, there is a lot more to come, and, and not least, you know, as you were suggesting, you know, the willingness to to feeling comfortable and, and getting to the office, how you get there and, and so forth. But I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to I'm going to jump to to my last question, Sean, which is sort of the end and how this all might end, which is a hugely difficult question, of course, because none of us know. But I'm going to ask it anyway, because that's my job. So do you think that we're now coming to the end of the pandemic or is there a serious risk of new variants, which we touched on earlier, and, and, and further waves coming along the line to knock us off course? Well, I think, uh, as I said earlier, that uh, this is, of course, uh, COVID, COVID-19. This is one infection. We have been saying in the public health community for some time that we can expect these uh, infections to jump from animal to man and you can get new diseases emerging. And we've been seeing them over the years. Uh, back in the before SARS, there was a sort of view that we'd sorted out infectious diseases and that it was just the sort of diabetes, hypertension, non-communicable diseases that were the issue. I think we now realize it's a so much more complicated picture. And the, the, there is an interrelationship, of course, between um, non-communicable and communicable diseases. Uh, and so we may well see other diseases coming along. But before we see other diseases coming along, to your question of, uh, uh, is this pandemic over? Well, if you take a UK view, the figures look like uh, they're looking good, that, that you know, the rate, rates are right down uh, and it looks as if the vaccines are effective against the variants that have emerged so far. So it looks quite rosy, but if you just look across to India, you'll see the pandemic has not finished. And then you think globally, and there is a big message here that this is not just about what we can do in the UK. This is a global challenge. So the pandemic is still raging globally. Uh, and I think we can expect to see other countries going through the same um, difficulties as India because of the lack of um, healthcare systems, the lack of uh, capacity, the lack of resource. Hence why um, countries have come together to create uh, co uh, COVAX um, led by the World Health Organization, which buys um, and supplies uh, vaccine to uh, poorer countries, I think the 92 countries on the list who, who benefit from that. And, and as Jeremy Farrer from The Welcome says, you know, until we're all safe, no one's safe. So we can get a sense of security within our own UK bubble. Uh, we can't get it even across to France yet. The French rates are much worse at the moment, uh, and, but they're going down. Uh, the rates in India are, are, are really tragically high and Pakistan, 
to, hence they've gone onto the red list recently. Uh, so it, the pandemic is still there. The disease is possibly phrased endemic now in the UK. We're not going for zero, uh, zero COVID. Um, and I'm not sure anyone really means zero COVID actually. I must say, I'm not sure quite how you do it if you're gonna have anybody ever coming across your borders again. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so it's quite hard to say you're going for zero COVID. I think we're not going for zero COVID. I think we're going for an endemic situation in which we understand the disease we we get sight of the uh, we we get enough information to understand the uh, the variants as they come along. We the vaccine scientists are brilliant and they are able to tweak the vaccines. We're going to see boosters coming in for the most vulnerable. So we're, we're, we're shifting gear. Uh, what we're hoping is we're not having to then suddenly we suddenly don't see a variant such as we saw back in late November, early December that suddenly catches us all unawares and we have yet another um, uh, spike. I think the thinking at the moment is that uh, we are, and, and thinking changes all the time. So it's really, that's really something I have learned is that, you know, you, as the science emerges, you, you, your thought processes and the way you compute them change. So at the moment, it's very much that we will have uh, an endemic COVID. We will probably have a vaccine program like we had the flu. It will become much more normalized. And some of our behaviors will continue such as, um, you know, hopefully the hand washing will continue. It should have been continuing anyway. You know, you talk, we were supposed to be taught as kids to hand wash. The hand wash. So uh, we, we need to sort of, so some of this is common sense. We may need to institute some more regulations in the future. But hopefully we've learned so much from this that we can apply the lessons quickly and we act quickly and um, we will see uh, this particular COVID-19 uh, held at bay. Uh, I'm hopeful that that will happen in the UK. I'm hopeful that the global effort will reach the countries that need it in a timely manner. And that is the challenge, really, uh, and that we can get back to a much freer and uh, more open uh, way of living and traveling. Uh, but, but we have to just stay cautious and stay careful and listen to the science. And I think the science, the scientists have absolutely, have absolutely shown how um, essential they are to this, to this whole process of controlling the disease. Well, hear, hear to that, Sean, I do hope you're right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I, I, I think so, and clearly the happily the UK position is vastly improved from where it was, as you rightly say, that is that is not the case elsewhere, particularly in, in India, of course, where the situation is tragic. And I think when you look at the stats, although you know hundreds of millions of people have now been vaccinated all over the world, as a percentage of the global population, the number who've had a jab in their arm is very, very small indeed. So, you know, we've got an awfully long way to go with this thing before there is, you know, genuine control. And there will undoubtedly be some bumps in the road, a road ahead. But, but you know, it is astonishing what has been achieved. If you think, you know, when I, I was starting these conversations a year or so ago, and of course, nobody, nobody knew if a vaccine would be discovered exactly right, exactly right. <laughs> if, you, if you said a year ago you know will there be a vaccine rollout starting in january i think you know most scientists were going no 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 you know even with a good wind it won't happen Absolutely. and then here we are with not just one vaccine but a whole radical change in how vaccines are made and a whole choice of candidates, and uh, you know, more and more coming into the into the onto the market. So it is, and, and, and there's also been advances in drugs, and uh, you know, like the use of dexamethasone, but other new drugs coming along. There's been huge innovation uh, methods of intensive care control. So it's huge innovations, but mainly for the richer countries. So it is a matter here of global equity and of actually ensuring global equity, because without global equity, we are continually at risk. And, and it, if we go right back to where we started, those dirty conditions in the, in the wild animal markets in China, I think they are beginning to address them. They need to, because I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're, so not great. <laughs> uh, uh, so if you've got those, you've got to you've got to actually tackle potential sources. You've got to tackle all sorts of issues like that, and so that does take time.
No, you're absolutely right, Sean, and you make a very good point about the richer countries, you know, and one thing that's perhaps lost in some of these debates is that we've been able to do this and, and the US and, and the EU and so forth, because we can afford to do it. Exactly. And there are many, many countries in the world that are not in that position. We're going through this extraordinary experiment of, of sort of uh, quantitative easing on steroids, where we're, we're sort of printing, printing money that the, the Bank of England is buying from the government, you know, at, at incredibly low rates of interest to sort of magic the problem away financially. And you can, you can do that to a degree and rich sophisticated mm -hmm. countries with, you know, five star health structures can do this. That is not the case in, in much of the world because they simply can't borrow money at, the, at those sort of mm -hmm. levels mm -hmm. and they don't have the infrastructure. So there is, a, mm -hmm. there, is a great, there is a great divide there and we should always be aware of that, but we could go on, but sadly we are out of time. Okay. Which is a great pity because we, we could talk for long, but it's been an enormous pleasure, Sean. I'm very, very grateful to you for kindly spending some time with me today. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you. you today, Sean. It, it's been a pleasure as I say. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And until next time, from Sean and from me, thank you very much and goodbye.